Hi everybody, welcome to the remote work panel. This panel, we're gonna talk a little bit about remote work and how it's impacted everybody this past year. We've got some great Okta customers joining us today, and I think it's gonna be a fantastic panel and hopefully you get something out of it. So I'm gonna have the panelists introduce themselves. So Joyce, would you like to introduce yourself today? Sure thing. Hi everyone, I'm Joyce O'Connor. I am the head of identity and access management at Biogen. Biogen is a biotech company. We like to say that we are pioneers in neuroscience and we are known for producing therapies for debilitating, debilitating diseases in the autoimmune and neurodegenerative areas. As the head of identity and access management, I'm responsible for a portfolio of projects, as well as running the day-to-day -day operations for the security systems that, we're, that we use to protect our workforce's identities, as well as our access levels and permissions. Great. Craig, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you very much. My name is Craig Perrett. I'm the Global Head of Identity Architecture at WPP. WPP is the world's largest media and marketing company. Um, we've been built out by acquisitions and mergers over the years. And my role within WPP is to look after identity from a strategy and an architecture point of view. We're looking at consolidating all the 150 different types of directories with 120,000 different people and globally of 112 different countries all into a single source, a single solution of Okta. Great. Rick, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Yep. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Rick Paterzo and I am the manager of applications and systems on the corporate IT team at, here at Grubhub. Uh, Grubhub is headquartered in Chicago uh, and is the leading online and mobile food ordering and delivery marketplace with the largest network of restaurant partners. Um, our applications and systems team provides IT corporate governance for all of our on-prem and SaaS applications. We provide endpoint security and solutions for all our end user systems and we also manage our identity gov governance platform uh, to make sure the organization has the tools they need to accomplish their goals daily. Awesome. I think everybody got a little bit more familiar with Grubhub this past year since we were all at home ordering food. So I'm going to go ahead and continue the conversation with you, Rick. So this year was a big transition for organizations. At about this point last year is when businesses started to realize they weren't going to be able to go back into the office really quickly because of COVID and the pandemic. How do you think your organization responded to that call for remote work? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I I would say similar to just a lot of organizations, even here in Chicago, just being a major city, um, we needed to adjust very quickly. So not only did um, we have the uh, the emphasis of, of having everybody at Grubhub work from home, but there were also local laws and regulations that wouldn't even allow us to travel into the city, right? And so we needed to abide by those laws. And so we're very fortunate that we have a very strong uh, infrastructure and network team here at Grubhub. So we had the solutions uh, in place to allow remote work pre-COVID. And uh, one of the, the the struggles that we had was how to ramp up the uh, ability to have, you know, 100% remote work. So making sure we had enough laptops, making sure we had the right, right VPN access, uh, making sure Okta was structured in a way where users can just log in and access the tools they needed. And so um, normally, you know, when an organization prepares for something like that, we, we sort of have a, a long runway, uh, but with COVID hitting, uh, you know, that needed to be shortened by a handful of weeks. Uh, and so you know, very proud to be part of that solution and being able to get it done. So Joyce, how did Biogen handle that transition to remote work rapidly? Sure. Well, we've had a flexible working program at Biogen for a number of years now, and many positions at our company were already taking advantage of that, myself included, as well as all the people on the team that I manage. Um, given the nature of our business, though, there were a number of positions that were not able to work remotely in the past. Um, for example, the people who are working in the, in the laboratories, um, people who are conducting various kinds of research, people who are working with healthcare providers to ultimately get therapies into patients, um, they hadn't previously been able to work remotely. And the pandemic really allowed us to push the envelope and allow more people to work remotely um, in creative ways. And so what we did in IT was we did more of what we're already already doing. You see, in IT, our entire mission is to enable our peers to work more efficiently as well as more securely. 
And certainly Okta is a big part of that strategy. So when the pandemic came around, um, everybody already had Okta deployed on their devices. Um, we issue laptops to most people, but not everyone. We also use virtual desktops as well as um, allow people to take advantage of, of their own devices. And we issue mobile devices sometimes too. So really um, using Okta allowed our, our expanded workforce to work more remotely or work remotely in a more secure way. And, and that was really enabling for our company. In addition, the pandemic certainly um, inspired us to step up our zero trust ambitions and projects. We already had projects underway to, to implement technologies that complement um, Okta for single sign-on as well as multi-factor and adaptive authentication. And so we just, we really stepped up that project um, to start to complete it more quickly. Craig, can you tell us how WPP really responded to that quick shift to remote work? Certainly. So traditionally WPP was pretty much everybody who needed to go into the office. You had the, the rendering of all these large 8K videos and things like that which would indicate you would need to be on a physical device to actually do all these things. You wouldn't necessarily be able to handle it on most common laptops today. So the, the shift from moving from everybody being in the office to all of a sudden everybody had to be working remotely was a huge challenge. Okta enabled this from a perspective that we could start offering a lot of the VDI environments, the virtual desktop environments, by using various cloud vendors in this pursuit. And with that, what also came onto the creative thinking as well, where we could start using the, the 4K rendering in the cloud and actually offer that facility. And you can then use Opta just to authenticate you in, do the provisioning aspect, and then use any laptop to actually um, do the job. Which meant that we weren't a, we didn't need to be a traditional nine to five in the office Monday to Friday job anymore. You could do it from home. You can do it, not wouldn't quite go down as far as the local cafe or whatever but you could definitely actually be anywhere you wanted to and you can actually start doing it, which means you could be in the office, you could be in someone's camper van, you could be um, even at your, your local holiday resort or something like that, you can work anywhere now. And the traditional idea of everything being on-prem uh, from a WPP point of view is also shifting as well. As Joyce was mentioning there about the zero trust model and next-gen devices, we are looking at moving all our infrastructure from on-prem and legacy kit now to a cloud or hosted platform. And we are trying to become a, a cloud provider of cloud solution up there. That's really interesting. So Joyce, you and Craig both bought up Zero Trust. Rick, how are you handling Zero Trust within Grubhub? Sure, uh, yeah, so uh, my team manages the day-to-day -day environment that, uh, of, that that's associated with Okta. So at a foundational level, uh, any application that is coming into Grubhub, um, no matter how small or large, whether it affects three people on a QA team or is an enterprise solution like our telephony or let's say Salesforce, um, it needs to go through the same checks and balances no matter what. And so at a foundational level, what we try to do is we try to integrate that application into Okta. So, uh, uh, SAML by default, right? And so if we can go ahead and do the SAML configuration by the application, then only employees can access the application that way. So we, we make sure we have that zero trust model through the security aspect of things. Um, if we can actually enforce it on the application level, that's just an extra step, right? So if an application allows for it, we go ahead and do that. And so Okta provides the ability for us to go ahead and, and manage uh, applications uh, in, in the way we want. Um, in addition, uh, we also look to things like um, restricting IP addresses. So we have offices um, not, not only all across the country, but also all across the world. And so if we try to lock down certain offices that we know there's a very small hub in a very specific part of the world, um, and only those folks can access uh, Okta in a certain way, we'll, we'll go ahead and make sure we restrict that. And so uh, that foundational security layer is always there, and, and we try to restrict it. So not only did we look to enforce that pre-COVID, but um, I think that need just skyrocketed post-COVID with just the ability of everyone working remotely. Yeah, no, I totally see that. So another point that jo Joyce brought up that I thought was really important is the BYOD aspect of zero trust. How are you guys educating your end users around the zero trust model when it comes to BYOD devices? Joyce, how are you guys doing that? Yeah, so we have a, a new employee onboarding program um, and a similar program for, for our non-employee workforce. 
so that on people's first day of work, where we're making sure that they're able to get into their new devices, um, if Biogen is issuing devices to them, and we help them get Okta set up. More broadly, we have a white glove service that we utilize with executives to make sure that all of their security needs, given their unique position as executives, they're somewhat more vulnerable. Um, and so our white glove service makes, makes sure that their, their security is, is shored up as, and, and that they're having a good user experience too. In addition to that, we made it a point to really step up our training and awareness with our workforce last year. Um, about two years ago, we started utilizing gamification as a way of helping to educate people in a fun way about security. So we partner with um, a couple of companies that give us fun ways to bring people together and to learn about security through the course of the game that they're participating in. The games have various storylines. So for instance, there might be a... Um, a storyline that involves a real data breach, well, actually, I guess a fake data breach, but a data breach. And the members of the of the team in the game have to figure out how the data breach happened and, and to solve it. Or you might be asked to, um, to join an organization that's like the CIA, CIA and audition to become someone on the team. So those are really fun ways for people to learn about security through the course of the, of the game and the clues that are offered. In addition to that, we bring in guest speakers that help people to improve security in their personal lives. So I don't know any parents in the last year, for instance, that haven't been, been more concerned about their children's security. So we bring in guest speakers to talk about it and to give um, our, our workforce a forum for asking questions to help them to improve security in their personal lives. And everyone knows that when you, when you utilize good security hygiene in your personal life, you make a point of doing that in your, in your work too. And I guess one of the things that we're really taking advantage of there with both the gamification and with the speaker series is that we've noticed that people have been more attuned to their personal security and their work security in the last year. Maybe it's because everyone is sitting in their own homes and looking at their routers all day, um, potentially. <laughs> But, but we're finding that people are much more interested about learning how to improve their own security and how to protect Biogen um, than they have been in the past. And, and we're really exploiting that and, and taking advantage. And I think that helps everybody personally and professionally. That's pretty awesome. That's a great way to look at it. it really makes people have that onus uh, to look at security themselves. I know with everything going on with the pandemic, there was a lot of phishing attempts and other things to still personal data. So I think that does make it a little bit more personal. You collect the personal data, you enforce that then at work. So that's really a great way to do it. Craig, how's WPP doing that? So with WPP, what we're looking at doing is trying to bring the, the modern devices, uh, like I said before, the zero trust and the next gen devices, so that if anything does happen to a laptop, for example, my laptop blows up for any reason, it's just overheated and worn out to form excessive use at home, I then go down to the local shop, literally just pick up a device, take it home, plug it in, and just authenticate in using Okta into a cloud service. And then straight away, or using um, the different types of tooling you've got out there from the next gen environment, you can then start downloading all the applications. You can get all the facilities and everything you need pretty much up and running within half a day which means that in the past, you would have to take your laptop to your local RT team. You would have to get them to re-image it and put all the security checks and balances, et cetera, which would often, in my case, when I had this issue um, previously, it would often take days. Whereas now you're looking at a matter of hours, you can literally just go out, buy a laptop, put it in, and it still has the same security posture, if not better than what you used to have because everything is now managed in the cloud. So it means you're not confined, again, to being in a physical office anymore. And I think that is the biggest key to actually going forward with a lot of the technologies we're looking at. We need to make sure that security, as Joyce was saying, security is key, education is key, and making sure that everybody who is using a laptop, whether it's BYOD or whether it's a, a laptop issued from the company, we need to be very mindful of the fact that it is still got sensitive information on there. We need to be careful of that. I mean, that's really impressive how everybody's kind of shifted, made that really rapid shift over to that work from anywhere type model. 
when you look at your business as a whole and you start thinking about the next six months, once we become start coming out of the pandemic, people are starting to travel more openly and do everything. Has the mindset of your business really shifted around this? Do you think it's going to have a, a long-term impact on your business? And how do you think that's going to evolve over time? Are you going to end up going back to an office setting? Do you think you're going to stay remote? I mean, and then following up on that too, let's figure out, you know, and discuss a little bit about the security posture of the different threats we think that might bring in. So Craig, do you want to talk a little bit about that and how that's going to work? Certainly. Sure, no problem. So from a WPP perspective, what we've ended up doing is we already had that mindset of almost a campus type of build. So we're looking at consolidating a lot of these, these smaller offices into one larger campus. So in the London area, we've got tens, if not well, more than 50 odd different um, smaller buildings. And now we're consolidating those down to potentially, well, as little as five larger campuses which means that going into the future, you wouldn't necessarily go into your office anymore and you wouldn't necessarily have a designated desk that you would sit at and you would have your picture of your kids up there and a pot plant over here. It would be more of a, um, a, a style of you go in, you, you book a desk for the day, whichever campus you want to go to, wherever your, whichever best suits you, you would go there, you would sit down, you could have, um, whether it's a breakout area, you could have a phone booth, things like that. So it's, it's now more focused on what you need to do if you need to go into the office and especially with a lot of things that are happening with COVID it's made people realize that you don't have to be in the office anymore to actually get your work done we said earlier is that people you can work from anywhere now which is a camper van or even your your holiday home etc and I think the only time now to actually get you need to go into the office is when you're actually having a, a huge meetup and most of the time it's, it's a case of that it's it's a social interaction that you need to actually get where you need to be in a physical meeting room with the flip charts and all the rest of it and actually have a like a powwow session to get things done and the brainstorming, etc. Not to say you can't do that remotely, which you can. It, it's we're obviously doing it right now. We're doing this whole conference thing remotely. But it's it's good to know that a lot of focus has now been around the the idea that people don't have to be watched over your shoulder by your manager anymore. You, we can get the job done. We can do it remotely. And WPP specifically is looking actually at opening up the avenues here to say, well, you don't have to come in five days a week anymore. Work from home if you want. You can work from wherever you need to. As long as you get the job done, that's the main thing. And I think that's the focus on a lot of people. Just get the job done. And we actually, personally, I find I'm actually working better and harder now from home because I don't have the three hour commute anymore every day that I that I could have done. You, you wake up, you're feeling more refreshed, more enlightened. You can then actually start the day on a good footing rather than kind of all blurry eyed and with a with a magazine under your arm strolling into the office because you've had what three hours less sleep now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my commute is like five minutes from, you know, working, walk, walking all the way through down my kitchen or down through my kitchen into my office and grab a cup of coffee on the way, you know, it's, it's, it's not hard, right? Uh, the hard part is I do find myself working longer days because I start earlier and I work longer because I don't leave work. That is one of the other things that we have to think about too. So Joyce, um, how's this working for Biogen? Yeah, so when I reflect on, when I think about the future, I, I reflect on our IT strategy and our security strategy a little bit. From, a, from an IT strategy perspective, we, we generally have good architecture practices at Biogen, which means that we don't allow proliferation of tools that do the same thing. So in that vein, Okta is our single sign-on multi-factor authentication tool end of story. And that makes support easy and it makes the user experience consistent and simple, which is, which is great. It's what we're aiming for. When it, and then I, I boil that down a little bit more to our security strategy. And there we want to make sure that every person, every device, every bot has an identity and is continually authenticating. And when we keep our architecture simple, that's much easier to do. So when, when, I, when I think about the future, as long as we're able to keep our IT strategy and our architecture practices good, and we're able to employ good security to protect our, our human, our bot, and our machine identities, 
there's no reason that we can't allow our workforce to work from anywhere, like what Craig said. Um, people expect that now. Back in the old days, your boss would catch you um, if they had to reach you on your cell phone because you weren't sitting at your desk waiting or, or ready for a phone call. But now it's entirely expected that you're not working in your house all the time. People have meetings in their car so that they can get privacy from time to time. People work from vacation homes. They work from boats and campers and any place. And I think that's healthy, it's good. It helps people with that nirvana thing that we call work-life balance. In addition to that, I think that for Biogen, this is really going to open up doors for recruiting into parts of the world that we haven't been able to recruit talent in the past. Before, if you weren't able to get yourself to a Biogen office, you just weren't going to necessarily be a candidate that we would speak to when we were looking for, um, for talent. And most of you know who work in security that finding talent um, in a niche discipline can be really a challenge. So I think that this is going to be great for our recruiting. I think that it's going to allow us to tap into talent pools that we haven't been able to talk to before. And I'm personally really excited about the future. Uh, that's a really good point. Being able to get and pull from talent pools that you weren't necessarily looking at previously because of location, I think that's going to be really key for a lot of businesses because then people can live in different areas. They don't have to live in downtown New York. They don't have to live in bigger cities. They can move out a little bit more and maybe you'll find the best talent in the middle of nowhere. You never know. So Rick, how's this working for Grubhub today? And what are you guys thinking about for the future? Um, so I, I'm actually going to echo a lot of what Joyce and Craig said. Actually, I really love what Greg mentioned, and that is that um, get it done type attitude, right? No matter what it takes. And that's actually a lot of how we kind of focus our time on the IT uh, corporate side of things. And so uh, we definitely have proved that we can work from home. Uh, I think it's pretty obvious now. I mean, we're, we're a full year in. Um, and so um, not only has our IT group uh, sort of proved that um, this can work remotely and not being able to or actually not having to go to the office, uh, but we've actually demonstrated that the entire organization, right, no matter where you are in the country, uh, you can do that. Um, and in addition, um, and similar to Joyce, you know, previously, we would target are hiring uh, around locations that are central to our offices. So um, I'm, I'm located in Chicago. Uh, and previously, when I would look for someone on my team, um, I would start with Chicago. And depending on that, that niche type requirement, right, we would expand our offices. And uh, I would say, let's see, in the last maybe six months, we've actually hired an individual that his sole responsibility is application governance, primarily around Okta. Uh, and uh, in the past, that would have been a Chicago hire, and we were able to find him, fortunately, halfway across the country, uh, and, it, and it's been great. So I think it definitely did um, open up avenues for us to start looking at talent uh, outside of our maybe smaller areas where, where we have our offices. So that definitely is a change. Um, in terms of security, um, you know, I, I definitely we, we're definitely keeping the emphasis around where that where's that foundational level. So things like um, uh, multi-factor authentication, similar to what Joyce had mentioned, making sure we do things like uh, IP address restrictions, making sure that we SAML enforce all of our applications, uh, making sure we have the proper users uh, correlated with the proper groups inside of Okta for their specific applications, right? And then doing an audit uh, around that uh, continuously. Uh, and so at, at a minimum, uh, that's what we strive for. Uh, and so uh, with 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 the work from home um you know i think that just kind of just launched that um in, in going 100 miles per hour um and um you know i know grubhub uh, for a fact that we, we've been busy pre-covid uh and then when with the pandemic um it just had like explosive growth for us uh in in the industry so um a lot of it was just we had a, a massive hiring spring we still do um, and we had a huge just intake of, of customers and trying to, uh, you know, making sure that our systems are, are, are uh, making sure that we can provide the tools and functionality needed for our, our internal users to be able to keep Grubhub happy and healthy and operating uh, on a daily basis. And so, um, uh, yeah, I mean, as far as the future goes, you know, I just see us kind of more tightening around security making sure that um, people have a level of access that's needed, right? And nothing more, uh, having them give, provide the ability to request that additional access if they need it, um, doing things like um, adaptive MFA, right? So depending on, uh, let's say, if you're logging in from your house every single day, um, you might not be prompted for that second uh, uh, authentication method, right? So we, we do look for ways to try to make life a little bit easier for end users. Uh, and I just see us continuing on that path. 
Yeah, that's pretty interesting with the adaptive MFA being able to set those those landmarks right to where people are supposed to be looking at different IP addresses or machines or anything like that to have that step up. Um, looking at everybody's going to be expanding their remote work, right? How does that change zero trust for you looking forward? If we're looking at the change in dynamic work, now all of a sudden is zero trust becoming more of a top level initiative in your organization? Are you seeing that remote work and that security posture being more of that top level initiative instead of just an IT, oh my gosh, we have to do it. We have to be able to supply it. We have to be able to support it. Are you seeing that, that growth from an advocacy coming from the top down? Joyce, what do you think? Yeah, I think that cybersecurity and this thing called the cloud were really the domain of the of the IT professionals in the past. And now I think that we've got employees um, of all types, including executives, who are looking to log into cloud-based applications from various devices at various times of day and in various parts of the world. And because they want the convenience, I think that they also recognize more intuitively now than in the past that it also has to be secure. And therefore, I think that there is a greater appreciation for why we need to have security um, and spend make the investments that we do. Um, and I think that that's really positive and healthy. I think that, that these topics that have been in the past very confusing and intimidating for people are, generally our workforce is much more attuned to why we need to um, continue to put, put our, our, you know, make an investment in security um, so that we can offer people the flexibility to use any device anywhere and to do that securely. So I, I think it's good. Again, I'm very, I'm very optimistic about the future. So Rick, what, how do you think that top-down approach and future looking and zero trust kind of all go together? Yeah, um, so I would definitely say that security was always top of mind for our group, uh, but I think now, especially more with the work from home, um, that that the emphasis has definitely been uh, 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 there. Um, I. Uh, j just from my experience, um, and this isn't even necessarily a grow up, but just in general, um, I don't feel that you can have a proper application government strategy without a proper uh, identity access uh, strategy as well. I think they go hand in hand. Uh, and so, you know, you can go ahead and onboard as many applications as you like. Uh, and, and obviously, Okta is our, our standard, right, single sign-on platform, and that's where we onboard our applications. But um, if the onboarding process uh, and offboarding at the same time, if that isn't well-defined and proper, right, then you're going to get a lot of folks getting access to tools that maybe they should or shouldn't have, right? And so um, that's what our team really tries to do is kind of find that healthy balance. So it's the ability to make sure that someone can do their job um, day in, day out, um, and not necessarily get frustrated. And, and Okta actually helps us do that. And that's, you know, provide a, a very nice, simple dashboard. Uh, and then the goal for our team is you only have the applications that you need right on that dashboard, right? And nothing more. Uh, and then you sort of you work your way up from there. At least that's that's our 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 our, um, our strategy. Uh, and so uh, from a security perspective, um, it's very important for us to make sure that when users are being onboarded, that we have the proper access controls for that. And then at the same time, uh, users that are either leaving the company or maybe even just moving diff to different groups. Um, you know, a, a simple example would be maybe someone that was in a, a finance role moving into more of like a, an account management role. And so they might be purviewed to tools that have, you know, certain financial information. So we want to make sure that they're offboarded properly. Uh, and so uh, our group, you know, we, we take we make sure we look at Okta logs all the time, even something as simple as of uh, someone reporting that they can't log in. Uh, the first thing that I do is I log into my admin Okta dashboard and I, I look up their profile, check the logs and say, all right, you know, was it a, an IP issue? Was it just a bad password? Uh, or maybe they just weren't onboarded properly. Maybe we had a name uh, incorrectly spelled. Uh, and so um, but that's where I feel both of those strategies go hand in hand. It's the onboarding and offboarding process of our employees, our partners and our contractors. Uh, and then really just having a heavy emphasis on how we onboard these applications. So um, going back to what I mentioned about just having that, that governance uh, foundation, that is keeping SAML top of line to make sure that we um, um, sort of harden our security approach, uh, and then we work our way from there. So if the application doesn't allow for SAML, uh, then we look at things like SWA, uh, right? We make sure we have an admin account in there, uh, and then 
from the identity perspective, you know, we look at things like skim provisioning. So can we automate users being onboarded into an application and then offboarded uh, without really any type of human interaction? Uh, and so that's really what our foundation is. And so with the, with the work from home model and our emphasis on security, we've really ramped up both of those process on identity access management, as well as application onboarding. Um, and I just see more of that uh, as we continue to scale. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. I know Joyce mentioned application onboarding. You guys, it seemed like you guys try to limit the type of applications that you use, or you, you limit how many of the applications that have the same function. Is that correct? We do, yeah. Um, I'm sorry, uh, I wasn't sure that was a question for me or Joyce. Yeah. <laughs> no, you go, go, Rick. <laughs> okay, yeah, uh, and we absolutely do, yeah. One of the interesting uh, uh, cultural aspects of Grubhub is this very much uh, entrepreneurial type spirit. And so uh, a lot of management allows their, their groups to sort of go out and research the tools that they need to do the jobs properly. So we may have a development team that uses a certain QA tool that another development team might choose to use a different one uh, based on whatever their workload is, right? And so um, it's really our, my team's job to make sure that that application is, is properly secured and we only have the, uh, the access that, that's needed uh, for the users for that application. Uh, but we definitely have put an emphasis with our corporate procurement team to, to limit the amount of applications that are all essentially doing the same thing, right? And not only is that best for just overall like corporate IT governance, but that also helps with financial implications and, and just day-to-day -day management. Right. So as we're coming to the end of the panel, just I'd like everybody to just kind of give me an idea or, or a concept of how do you think your end users security awareness has changed during this year of the pandemic? I knew my own security posture has changed working from home. I'm actually more aware of the apps my kids are using, um, put in a little bit more stronger security, even in my own house. But do you think your, your end users have really become more aware working from home of their own security footprint? Rick, what do you think? Yeah, no, uh, I actually liked how you, you mentioned your kids. Uh, I'm, at, I'm in the same boat. I have three young ones too. And uh, th this is the first year, two of them are on Chromebooks and one is on iPad, right? So going into second grade and kindergarten, right? Where previously my wife and I, we, we didn't really have to worry about that. So it's uh, not, not necessarily even securing our own home and making sure that, you know, they're not going on you know, YouTube or, or going to different sites that they shouldn't be. Uh, but having that same mindset here at Grubhub too is um, from, from the point where someone sits down at their desk and, you know, flips their laptop open, um, are they able to do their job that they need um, uh, in a way where it's not, not disruptive or, or might not maybe uh, pose some type of ne negative type feeling or impact uh, on our group. And so um, that's where we start looking at, okay, you know, going back to securing the the applications, uh, and Craig had mentioned that, whether it's an OIDC connector or SAML connector, right? So we always, we always start there. Uh, and so it's the, the setup, right? So the, the first you know, when we get an application request, I would say the first maybe week or two, um, it's really a lot of back and forth between the vendor, the business application owner, making sure you understand who needs access to the tool, you create up the security groups. Once that's done, and assuming we do have something like skim provisioning provided as well with our identity governance platform, um, that's really the hardest part. And everything should hopefully flow automatically. Um, so it doesn't matter what team you're on or what team you go to, or if unfortunately, if you have to leave, um, all of the processes uh, that are governed for your user account to a specific application or system um, is automatically governed. And that that is where I see really the, the future of our, our team going is really providing more emphasis around a lot of that automation. Uh, and then in addition, making sure we have the checks and balances needed. So um, if, even if you do have access and you are an active employee, you know, should you have the ability to see maybe a certain group or a, a, a certain financial role, right? Depending on, on the criticality of it. So it's, it's building the relationships internally at Grubhub with the, the key business application owners, making sure that we understand the requirements correctly, making sure we set up the application correctly, making sure we do the onboarding offboarding properly. Uh, but it's also, what are we doing as like an IT applications and systems group? And that is, uh, what, what is our foundational strategy? And so when our mission is that we're just, we're looking to uh, make sure that users have the ability to do their job day in, day out internally. Uh, and then at the same time, you know, making sure they can do it successfully um, and, and really minimize the amount of disruption for them. Uh, and so I really see the, the amount of automation um, that we're doing. Um, I just see that continuing, if not, you know, doubling, tripling the amount of, of what we're working on right now. Awesome. 
Craig, do you think your employees' security awareness has grown over this last year? I would definitely say it's grown just from the perspective of that they're all working from home and realize they don't necessarily have a, a server in the basement anymore or in a data center somewhere. They know that the that to access key critical files potentially are now in a storage location somewhere else, not in the physical building behind of, of your internal Wi-Fi location, etc. And just from a user perspective, I think that it's it's made them more aware. And with WPP, um, a few cool, five six years ago, a few min well, a couple of years ago, let's put it that way, we had a a bit of a data, a, um, we had a, a, a malware breakout. And I think that was key to everybody saying, well, we, we're not impenetrable. We, we, we do have flaws, we do have problems. I think the main thing for people to realize here is not the fact that we're impenetrable, we're, we're amazing and all the rest of it, we have a top of the line security system. No one does. But you need to put all these mitigating circumstances, whether it's the, as Rick was saying, they're having a proper JML or a workflow process in there, automation, whereas previously a user would be onboarded in a, in a small company and then, well, they left, unfortunately, but um, they left, but their account would still remain active. And that's an exploit that a lot of the um, unethical people might potentially try gain access to. And with Octo, with, with various different user flows, workflow engines, JML process, etc. You can start automating that with attestation policies around application and users. A lot of people don't necessarily look at the attestation around applications. If someone is not using an application for and it's a secure application for the last six months, do they actually need access to it? Because it just opens up the, the attack vector or the attack scope potentially for bad actors to come in. And I think that is that has been a big turning point. A lot of people are saying, well, let's reduce the footprint. There's only 10 people who need access to HR system. Well, why, why do we have 50 people? Why do we have 100 global admin accounts when we actually only need two or three? And I think that that's a thing and that's a focus specifically around IT, obviously. But that has also broadened out to a lot of the other avenues, especially when people think, well, I'm looking at a marketing campaign or something like that. Do I really need Joe Bloggs down the street who um, put a pretty picture on the on the on this marketing campaign? Does he need does he still need access? I'm obviously making a little tongue in cheek on that, but does he still need access for six months while we're running this campaign because he put a little picture on there? No, he doesn't. So let's remove the access and get it back to the the people who need access should stay there. No, that's great. Joyce, how do you think? the security posture of the individuals at Biogen has changed. Yeah, so I, I talked a little bit earlier about how I think people's new security awareness because of their working from home circumstances has improved their um, desire to improve security at work too. But I have three other observations that really speak to the new blurry lines between our professional and our personal lives. Number one, I know a number of people in Biogen, particularly my peers in security, who are utilizing their knowledge to help institutions within their communities, particularly, particularly their schools where their kids are, to be more secure. So reaching out to the schools and helping those schools improve security when they see something that could be improved reasonably easily. Number two, I think that People are sitting at home and they're experimenting with all kinds of new apps on their mobile devices. And people have a newfound appreciation when an app allows them to use single sign-on. And again, that awareness um, makes them more aware regarding single sign-on and an appreciation for how much easier it makes their, their life at work um, too. And similarly, number three, with people utilizing apps um, for the first time, you know, just trying apps out, you know, a new way to entertain yourselves. People are appreciating the amount of spam and advertisement that they're exposed to as a result of doing that. And I think that that makes people more security aware in work that you really shouldn't be requesting access to an application unless you really need it. Because every time you are getting access to something that you really don't need to do your job, you're putting yourself and the company at risk. So I think that those are three interesting things that have happened in the last year that I don't remember people talking about in the past. And um, again, it makes me really optimistic for the future. 
I think that's an interesting point. We could spam people who request admin access constantly to see if they want that admin access. Is that what we? <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. I do. I really, the power. I do like what uh, what Craig had mentioned, Adrian, and that's um, you know we we always talk about the onboarding and offboarding experience. So making sure new employees and, and partners and contractors come into the company and have the tools they need, and if if you leave, right, you, you limit that. Uh, but you know, Craig actually brings up a good point. Is even if you're an active uh, associate at Grubhub, um, do you need the tools that you have access to, right? And so, you know, simple tools like uh, like an Adobe product, right? So you have the full creative cloud suite, you know, you've had it for one or two years, but um, do we have the ability to check the logs to see if you even access anything there, right? And so like those type of applications have huge financial costs when you multiply them by hundreds if not thousands of people. And uh, that's actually one other aspect of Okta, Okta that I like using is is the log. So um, one of the first things that we did when we onboarded our our, our primary um, application uh, cloud manager, and that is just do a review of all the applications that currently exist in Okta, uh, and let's see let's just see which ones aren't even being utilized. Is this application even in use anymore? Are we paying for it, right? And so we started doing a lot of those logs, and you know we were able to to, to clean up a lot and, and find a lot and um, remove groups, and that's just making the overall system healthier. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I definitely like to echo what Craig mentioned, and that is um, making sure that we provide the security governance around even active accounts, active applications, uh, and that's one very useful thing that Okta helps us do is we're able to target that very easily with the logging. That's amazing to hear. So. We're pretty much at time right now, and I want to thank each of you for joining the panel today. It was great. Great conversation, great insight to each of your businesses and how you're handling zero trust with Okta and how you kind of handled remote work in the pandemic. I think we have some good topics, too, if we wanted to have a second panel later on. But anyway, I want to thank each of you for joining today and good luck. You know, I think remote work is going to be something that we're going to all be now dealing with. Not a bad way. It's a good way over the next few years and continuing to grow and continuing to see that security posture grow. So thank you so much for joining and look forward to hearing from you again. My pleasure. Thank you Thanks, very much. Everybody. Thanks very much for the opportunity.